Welcome back everyone. I'm Professor Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. Today we're continuing our discussion of electrophilic aromatic substitution in lesson 4.13. In our last lesson we talked about how the activating or deactivating nature of a substituent can lead to either a mixture of ortho and para as the major product or a meta substitution product as the major product in electrophilic aromatic substitutions where there's already one substituent on the benzene ring. Now one question you might ask yourself is, well, you're saying there's a mixture of ortho and para products, but is there some way that we can tell which of these would be present in the higher percentage? So one point to consider is that there are two ortho hydrogens that could be replaced or substituted for the electrophile, right? If we just sketch in a benzene ring and we think about some substituent already being here and we're trying to put another one on to substitute for a hydrogen, these two are both ortho, but there's only one para hydrogen. So one might think, okay, I have twice as many chances to do the ortho, maybe the ortho is favored. But the second consideration you might want to think about is, well, if there's already a substituent here, and I try to put another thing that's not a hydrogen, well, they might bump into each other. So the ortho position might be more sterically encumbered. So if we think statistically, we think ortho should be favored. If we think about things bumping into each other, these things that are not hydrogen that are bigger, we think about the para being favored. So because of these competing features, we generally don't know whether the ortho or the para would be formed in the greater percent yield just looking at a reaction without knowing all the conditions and the subtleties of the reaction. Although you can probably imagine that if I have an enormous group here that we might be able to say, okay, the ortho substitution is impossible. So we'll talk about some of those special cases a little later in the lesson as well. The other thing we can think about is, well, what if you have two substituents on the benzene ring or three substituents on the benzene ring or four before you put another substituent on? How do I know where to put the next substituent when there are already two there. Well, as a general rule, you only look at the more activating substituent of the two, and that more activating substituent will dominate the directing effect. You also have to consider, to some extent, the sterics, or the size of the group. It's easier to substitute next to a smaller group, of course. So let's consider these two examples down here. Well, consider these two substituents. We have chlorine and we have a methoxy group. Well, the methoxy group is a resonance donor. It can donate its lone pair. This is an activating group. I'll abbreviate that A. Chlorine, being a halogen, is a slightly deactivating group. So we have to use our first idea. The more activating substituent dominates the directing. So we kind of ignore the chlorine is there. And we say we should have an ortho and para substitution product mixture as the major product with one problem. There's a chlorine already positioned para to that directing group. So there's no hydrogen to be substituted. So that's not even a possibility in this case. That means the only product we will get is the ortho substitution product. So we have the methoxy group and one of the two hydrogens ortho to it will be replaced with the group that's added. In this case a bromine is added. Now this molecule is symmetric down the vertical axis, so it doesn't matter which of these two sites we choose for our bromine. So we learned two things from that example. The more activating OCH3 is the group that we choose to look at for directing where the next group goes, based on rule A. And then the chlorine blocks the para position, so we can't replace it. Remember, electrophilic aromatic substitution replaces a hydrogen, not a chlorine or some other group. Let's look at our next example. In this case, we have a nitration reaction, so we're going to be trying to put an NO2 group onto the benzene ring. But where? Well, if we look at the substituents, this is an alkyl group. That's a slightly activating group, not quite as good at activating as a resonance donor. Uh-oh, this other substituent is also slightly activating. So we say, okay, we probably have a mixture of each of these two directing the next substituent. So where would this group direct the next group to add? It would direct either ortho to it or para to it. Well, we can't add para to it because we have the t-butyl group there. All right, let's consider where the t-butyl group, this big group at the bottom, would direct the next group to go. It will also direct the next group to go either ortho to it or para to it. Of course, para 
to the tubular group is here, we have that site blocked by the methyl group. So we have two potential sites for substitution because each of these two groups have the same type of activating or directing ability. That's where, when you have a tie, you come into the second rule. It's easier to substitute next to a smaller group. So if I try to put a nitro group next to this big T-butyl group, and we don't have these H's drawn out, we can kind of see that the big group here is going to be blocking anything substituting ortho to it. So having the choice between these two sites, we're going to substitute at the site next to the smaller group. So we can draw our scaffold in and substitute one of the ortho positions with an NO2 group, one of the sites next to the methyl here, or here, the molecule again being symmetric about this vertical axis. So we have this nitro compound. So this example illustrates that if you're comparing two sites and you have the equal directing ability to each of the two sites, you want to favor the site where there's less repulsion for the added substituent. One other part of this rule is it's very difficult to place a third substituent between two existing substituents. So I showed you here how it was difficult to go beside one really big group. If I have two groups, even two methyl groups, it would be hard to squeeze between the two existing groups. I'll show you an example of that in the next page. So let's take a look at these examples. Let's look at the first one. Bromine and methyl are already on the ring. These reagents represent a friedel crafts alkylation reaction. We're trying to put another CH3 group onto the ring somewhere. Well, the bromine is a slightly deactivating substituent. The methyl group is a slightly activating substituent. So we're going to only look at the CH3 in terms of figuring out where the next substituent should add. This is not a deactivating group, so it's going to direct the next group to go ortho to it or para to it. So now we have three potential sites. And in this case, all three of these sites are chemically distinct. None of them are the same as one another because we don't have the type of symmetry that would allow them to interrelate with one another. So we have three possible isomers for the products. But we can rule out this site because it's going to be attempting to place a substituent between two existing substituents. So although the CH3 chooses that site as one of the sites to direct the next substituent to, that group just won't be able to come in between the two groups that are already there. So now we have a substitution beside a bromine or beside a methyl group. We don't have any really big branchy groups. So we're going to go ahead and decide that we have a mixture of those two potential isomers. So we start out with the base compound and we place the new methyl group either ortho to the methyl or para to the methyl. In each case, the new substituents beside one substituent. All right, well, let's consider our next example. We have ortho nitro toluene. And you have these conditions. If you did the reading, you know that those conditions represent a chlorination reaction. You don't always have to have FeCl3 to do the chlorination reaction. So we're going to try to put a chlorine onto the ring. And here we have a deactivating substituent and a slightly activating substituent. All right, so we're not going to use the deactivating substituent to direct the addition of the next group. We're going to figure out where the CH3 will direct. And it will direct either ortho to it, here or here, or para to it. Well, we can't substitute here because there's already a group that's substituted for the hydrogen. So we have two possible isomers. And we can draw those both in. Where the new group, the chlorine, goes next to a CH3, where it goes over here by itself. If you were really pressed, you might say, well, it might be a little easier to put the chlorine here where it's further away from anything, but generally in introductory class, you'd want to choose a potential product mixture where you have both of these. Next, we have this compound down here. We have two different substituents. We have the slightly activating CH3 group, but we have the resonance donor methoxy group. So this is an activating group. Resonance donor is better at stabilizing a carbocation than a simple inductive donor. So we're going to use that activating resonance donor to figure out where the next group will go. Well, the activating group directs the next group to go ortho to it or para to it. Well, the para position is already taken up by the CH3. There's no H to be substituted. And this molecule has symmetry about this axis. So the two ortho positions are equivalent to one another. So what we have is the base compound like this, 
and then we put the new group, this is an iodination, so it's an iodine, in one of the ortho positions.